Welcome to Pulse, and I'm so glad you came to join us in worship today. You know, it's hard to believe we're less than, uh, well, actually, this is our last Sunday before Christmas. And I was thinking, I wonder what this next week will be like. Here we are in the midst of all that's going on around us and the crazy increase of COVID, and, and yet there's still this hustle and bustle that connected to Christmas, and some of the stuff that we're used to doing is changing because... Well, we just aren't able to do it the same way. And I got thinking, you know, how does that impact us? How does, how does all this stuff that's going on impact us with our celebration of Christmas? It's tough to know. But here's what I do know. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, was still born in a manger, still died on the cross, and still loves us unconditionally. And as we look at what this week will hold and as we prepare for, for Christmas Day, my prayer for us this week is that we will allow the truth of who Jesus is to just flood our soul. My hope is that in the midst of whatever is going on, we will be able to capture moments Moments when we can just pause and reflect. Reflect on Jesus. Reflect on God's love and God's mercy. Reflect on the greatest gift that we've been given. I want to encourage you to join us with our, uh, our online music. It's, it's the songs that we'll be singing here live on Sunday morning. We have the playlist, so just, just check that out. And after you've checked that out, I invite you to come back and join us for, for the next in our series on the women of Advent. Uh, today is, is the second last. The final one will be Mary, the mother of Jesus, which I'll talk about on Christmas Eve. So let's pray together. Father, I just want to thank you. I thank you that in all the days of uncertainty and all the hustle and bustle of life, there are those moments. There are those moments where we can be still and know that you are God, where we can pause and pray for peace, those moments where we can just know the truth of Christmas is found in the manger and the fullness of Christmas is found at the cross. May the reality of who Jesus is just really sink into our hearts and minds today and each day. In Christ's name, amen. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the women of the genealogy of Jesus, the women of Advent. And we've looked at the story of Tamar, who was the mother of the twins. We looked at the story of Rahab, who was the mother of Boaz. And we've looked at the story of Ruth, who was the mother of Obed. Today, uh, we are going to look at the uh, mother of Solomon. And Solomon was one of the wisest kings in all of Israel's history. And then on Christmas Eve, we're going to wrap up our series by looking at Mary, the mother of Jesus. Let me read to you from the uh, Matthew chapter one, the first six verses of the genealogy. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Noshan, Noshan the father of Salmon. Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. It's interesting when we read this, isn't it? Because for all the rest, it says whose mother was Tamar, whose mother was Rahab, whose mother was Ruth. But in this case, in this case, it says whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now, some translations add in Bathsheba's name, but the original text does not. It, this is what it says, whose mother would, had been Uriah's wife. Why? Why wouldn't Matthew just simply write 
whose mother was Bathsheba. I think in order to gain some understanding, we need to go back and discover and listen to the story of this woman who's known as Uriah's wife. In order to do that, we have to go back hundreds of years, hundreds of years before Matthew even wrote the gospel. So for us, it's thousands of years. So Matthew wrote this gospel hundreds of years after, after this incident in which Solomon was born. We go back to the time of King David. And King David, um, we're going to look specifically in 2 Samuel. And the story of this woman who's Uriah's wife is going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 11. But before we go there, let me try to create for us a context. So in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 13, it says, And David made a name for himself. So, so David is, is being established as the king. He's making the name for himself. He's gaining his reputation. He's gaining his popularity. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, it says that, that David showed kindness and took Mephibosheth, the crippled son of Jonathan, into his house to sit at his table and to live in his house. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 10, we read the account in which David led the army and they totally defeated the Ammonites. And that gives us the context. David is on a roll here. David is, is establishing himself well as king and as leader. He's establishing himself well as the one who leads the troops to victory. And then we come to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it starts out this way. Let me read it. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent out Joab with the king's men. And then it says towards the end of that, but David remained in Jerusalem. It's interesting the way they describe it because it's like, well, spring's a natural time when kings go off to war and, and everybody does it, and yet David didn't. David, it says David stayed in Jerusalem. Maybe, we don't know why, maybe he was feeling pretty proudful and maybe he was uh, feeling invincible and he just thought, you know, the guys don't need me, I'm just going to hang out here and do whatever. Now let's listen to the rest of the story. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 through 27. Let me read them. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the son of Iliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get him, or to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I'm pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him, sent him to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go to his house. David was told, Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark of Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are, are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat. Among his master's servants, he did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fierce. 
Then withdraw from him, so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, When you finish giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up, and he may ask you, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech? son of, of Jerobesha, didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asked this, then say to him, Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger set out and went. To, when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, The men overpowered us and came out against us in the open. But we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messenger, say this to Joab. Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So here we are. King David is out when he should have been out on the battlefield, he's out walking around the top of his palace on, on top of the roof. And he looks out from that roof and he sees this beautiful woman bathing. And as he sees this beautiful woman bathing, he sends some men to, to go and find out about her. The men come back and they say to David, she is someone's daughter and someone's wife. Now, now these just weren't anyone that this woman belonged to, that this woman was connected with. She was Eliam's daughter, and Eliam was one of the 30 men that David held in honor, one of his 30 best warriors. She was the wife of Uriah, and Uriah was also one of those 30 best warriors that David had. And what this text doesn't tell you is that she was also the granddaughter the granddaughter of Ahithophel. And Ahithophel was one of David's best advisors. As a matter of fact, it, it said in 2 Samuel 16 that Ahithophel's advice is like that of one who inquires of God. This is who this woman was. This woman was the granddaughter of one of David's advisors. She was the daughter of one of David's top men. She was the wife of one of David's top men. This is where David should have said, Phew, okay, I won't touch. This is where David should have said, oh, I better walk away. He should have seen and said, she's off limits. That's what should have happened. But it didn't. It didn't matter to him. It didn't matter to him whose granddaughter she was, whose daughter she was, or whose wife she was. He wanted her. And so, so Uriah's wife, after she is done bathing to purify herself, has at least two, maybe more, we don't know the exact number, but it's plural, at least two or more of David's messengers show up at her place. And they come to her and they say to her, the king wishes to speak to you. He wants to see you. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm wondering, was she thinking, oh, Oh no, the king's going to tell me that my husband was killed in battle. Maybe that's, maybe that's what crossed her mind. Or maybe she thought, 
Well, it's so urgent that the king would want to see me at this moment. But whatever it was that she was thinking, she goes along with the messengers at the request of the king. Because you see, if the king requests, you don't say no or else that can end in death. So she goes with the messengers. Uriah's wife goes and, and goes along with the messengers into the presence of King David. And in a short period of time, in a short period of time, David takes advantage of her. She gets there, and he has her way with her. And then it says, and she went back home. You know, one of the things I've heard over the years is I've heard people suggest that, that Bathsheba was, was a seductionist. She, wanted, she went in there and, and played on David that she was as much to blame as he was. But there is nothing in this story that says that. There's absolutely nothing that would say any of that. What this story tells us is that this king with, with great power took advantage of Uriah's wife. And then after he'd taken advantage with her, after he'd had his way with her sexually, they didn't hang around and tell stories and joke and, and, and all that stuff. No, as soon as he was finished, she went home. He dismissed her. Let that sink in for a minute. It doesn't say that there was any mutual actions here. It says that David had his way with her. Uriah's wife was called into the king's presence to be sexually assaulted and then discarded. Imagine. Imagine the shame, the guilt, the fear. Imagine her not wanting anyone to know, and yet the messengers knew. And so she goes home in shame, in humiliation, wanting to just keep it inside, never wanting anyone to know. And then as time passes, she becomes pregnant. And she sends the message to King David, I'm pregnant. And what does King David do? He tries to cover up his tracks. He tells Joab to send home Uriah, and he tries to tell Uriah, hey, you've been out there fighting hard and on the battlefield. Why don't you go home? Why don't you go home and eat and drink and make love to your wife? But Uriah was a much more noble man, a much more, <laughs> a much more honorable man. And he refused that. And so David gets him drunk, hoping that he'll stagger home to his wife and, and something might happen. But again, Uriah goes out and he sleeps on his mat with the servants. So what's David do? David sends a note with Uriah to Joab, his commander, and it says, put Uriah on the front lines and make sure to pull back so he dies. So David has Uriah put to death. It's ironic to think that, that he asked Uriah to carry his own death sentence. But that's what he did. And there's Uriah's wife. And Uriah's wife is still dealing with the guilt and the shame and the fear. 
But now she's dealing with an unwanted pregnancy and with the death of her husband, the love of her life. And she grieves. And it says, after this time of grieving, David takes her in and makes her one of his wives. And if you read on in the story in chapter 12 of Second Solomon, or Second Samuel, excuse me, the baby that was conceived during this act of David, that baby dies. And so now here's Uriah's wife. She's dealing with the guilt and the shame, the fear, the death of her husband, and now the death of her baby. This is the woman that's that's talked about here in Jesus' genealogy. And if we stop there, we would say this is a tragic story. But God doesn't stop there. God works and moves in a way to bring about redemption, to to bring about something beautiful out of this. It says that later on, she gives birth to Solomon. And the next time we we read about her, it's in um, 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 1 and 2. And in 1 Kings chapter 1 and 2, David has now become an old man. And he is coming close to the end of his life. And he had promised Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, that Solomon would be the one to succeed him as king. But in the meantime, another one of David's sons, uh, Odaniah, Odaniah tries to rise up and establish himself as king while David is still alive. He tries to establish himself as a rightful heir to the throne. And so Nathan the prophet shows up and goes and talks to to Bathsheba. And he says to Bathsheba, Bathsheba, you need to know this and you need to go and talk to David and, and call upon him to honor his promise for Solomon. If you want to save your life and you want to save your son's life, you need to do this. And so out of, again, risk of being put to death because walking into the king and demanding is not something that is really recognized and honored. But she took that opportunity and she walked in and she spoke. And as we read the story, we find that, yes, King David officially establishes Solomon as his successor. And as we read on into the rest of the story in in 1 Kings chapter 1 and chapter 2, what we find is that Bathsheba, when Solomon comes in to take over as the king, Bathsheba becomes the queen mother. And as the queen mother, what does Solomon do? He shows her respect. We find that she comes in and and the king actually bows to her. But he does even more than that. He takes and he puts, he has a throne made and he has that throne put on his right hand, which is the place of honor. And in that place of honor, it is reserved for who? Uriah's wife, Solomon's mother, Bathsheba. You know, when we look at the story of Ruth that we talked that was talked about last week, Ruth's a real heartwarming story, isn't it? You know, it's it's kind of like one of those great happily ever after kind of stories. But when we look at the story of Uriah's wife, it's really heartbreaking. It's a story of lust and of rape of loss, of grief, of great sadness and great sorrow. She was forced into a situation. She was forced into a situation she didn't ask for. It was a situation (sighs) 
a situation that costs her her reputation and her preferred, preferred future. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that her dream was that she was going to spend the rest of her days with her husband Uriah and enjoy it with him. And if we, if we stop at the end of 2 Samuel, at the end of chapter 12, it's a heartbreaking story. And yet I think it's a story that many people today live. A story in which people of power have taken advantage of the more helpless. A story in which someone takes advantage of another person in order to have their needs met. A story of cover-up and deception. A story in which the person who is offended against carries shame and guilt. Fear, not wanting anyone to know. And I know that some of you listening today have some stories that are similar to Uriah's wife. And you've carried it. And it's impacted you. And it's created brokenness and shame and guilt. But I don't want us to stop at the end of 2 Samuel 12 because the story doesn't stop there. You see, God was still at work even, even when we don't see it in that first part. And as we move to 1 Kings and we look at chapter 1 and we look at chapter 2 and we look at how God gave to Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, that place of influence and honor, even through her brokenness, even through all that she went through. It reminds us. It reminds you and me that, that God calls the oppressed. God calls the outsider. God calls the broken to bring healing and justice to those who are oppressed and, and to those who, who feel like they're the outsider, cast aside and forgotten, to those who are part of a broken community. God wants to take those things of our life, those things that many times we want to hide and we, we don't want to talk about and we want to be shameful for. And he wants to take it and and walk us through that so that we can make an impact, so we can help others who are on, on, on that journey, others who have been victims of similar things. And when I take a look at this, I can't help but think about Jesus. It's a story of Jesus, right? He was mistreated by those in power. He was diminished. He became from someone everybody called out for, to, to someone that was rejected. And he ministered. He ministered to the oppressed and the forgotten and the broken. And he brought the message of God's love and the kingdom into their lives. And something changed. And it reminds me of our story. Of our story and how each of us have places of brokenness. Each of us have places of, of, of guilt and shame that, that have haunted us for years. But God wants us to know. God wants us to know that he has healing for us. And there's a place in his family, a place to belong, a place to be a part. 
Friends, as, as, as we look at the story of Uriah's wife, <laughs> it reminds me of this. There is no situation where we have been. There is nothing that has happened to us that will exclude us from the love of God and a place in his family. As we move forward in this Advent season, as we look at the story of Uriah's wife, may I invite you, may I invite you today to just simply say, Lord, you know my brokenness. You know my places of guilt and shame. Walk with me through them. Allow me to let you redeem them and to bring healing. And Lord, let me be a messenger of your love and your peace and your healing to those who are the oppressed and those who've been taken advantage of and those who are broken, that they too may find their place in your family. May the story of Uriah's wife bring the truth of Jesus and his love this Advent season into your heart. And may you know you belong to the family of God.